Hi, everyone, and good morning. I am Stephanie Killingsworth with the Scientist in Every Florida School program, and today we're stepping into the garden, a virtual field trip series presented by Mount's Botanical Garden and Scientist in Every Florida School. Today's topic, unlocking the mysteries of Easter Island, the road to scientific discovery. Scientist in Every Florida School is a free program housed within the Thompson Earth Systems Institute at the University of Florida. The CEFS program connects and builds long-term partnerships between teachers and scientists in order to bring current scientific research and big data into classrooms in Florida and beyond. My colleagues, Brian and Elise are with me today and we're so excited to be here. Mass Botanical Garden is a nationally acclaimed attraction for Florida residents and visitors alike with a mission to inspire and educate through nature. I'd like to introduce to you today, Joel Crippen from Mounts, who will take the reins from here to explore a little bit more around the garden and introduce everybody to today's scientists. Joel? Welcome everyone. Um, Mounts is a 14 acre botanical garden in West Palm Beach, Florida in the heart of Palm Beach County. We feature 25 display gardens featuring thousands of flowering and trees and um, shrubs that are suitable for a challenging South Florida climate. This year, we're hosting a permanent art exhibit of replicas of the Moai statues of Easter Island. In the next slide, you'll see a construction diagram of the sculptures to be installed at Mounts. They'll be casted and poured into place out of concrete and on firm foundations. In the picture to the left, notice the two big trunks on either side of the frame. These are Puerto Rican hat palms. They're to represent the Jubea palms that once graced Easter Island when the Rapa Nui people arrived. In the next slide, you'll see us as we move these gigantic palms into place. As big as the Puerto Rican hat palm is, it's half the size of the Jubea palm of Easter Island. We also chose our tropical shade forest to site this exhibit as once Easter Island was forested when those um, Polynesians arrived. So right now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Carl Lipo. He's an Associate Dean and, uh, of Research and Programs at Harper College and Professor of Anthropology at Binghamton University. Originally from Wisconsin, Carl received his Bachelor of Science and Master of Arts degrees at University of Wisconsin and then finished with his doctorate at University of Washington. His research focuses on the intersection of evolutionary theory, anthropology, and prehistory. He has conducted archaeological field work using remote sensing and geophysical techniques in a wide range of locations around the world, including the Mississippi River Valley, California, Guatemala, Pakistan, and Greece. For the past, past 15 years, he has worked on Easter Island and other areas of the Pacific studying the spread of human population across Eastern Polynesia. He is also an entrepreneur, co-founding allrecipes.com. Welcome, Dr. Lipo. You're on mute. Ooh, I'm mute there, I gotta unmute. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate the invitation to come talk to you about my research and specifically to talk about Easter Island and the archeological and cultural things that, that occurred there and uh, that are happening there that you can go visit. Uh, let me share my screen here uh, so you can get some slides. Um, oops, share screen. Uh, doo -doo -doo. All right, here we go. So, um, Again, my name is Carl Lippo. I'm a professor of anthropology, or I'm an archaeologist uh, who studies at uh, and teaches at Binghamton University, which is up in upstate New York. Today, I want to talk to you about these moai, these gigantic statues uh, that are found on Easter Island that are really quite remarkable, and try to share with you a little bit about how, as a scientist, as an archaeologist, we go about studying these mysterious objects uh, and, and how we can figure out um, a little bit about the past and what people were doing and why they might have been doing these kinds of things on this island. But what, what we find on Easter Island is really quite remarkable and it's a great, it's a great tale of science as well as uh, prehistory. 
So here's here's Easter Island. Uh, Easter Island is a uh, Pacific island. It's in the easternmost part of Polynesia, off uh, in uh, off of the coast of South America, but about two thousand miles off the coast of South America. It's it's an island that's far out, part of Polynesia, but far away from any other uh, any other mainland or other any other island. And when you get to the island, you can fly there today. In fact. Um, the island you can see, you know, all straight across it. It's a very small island uh, out in the middle of the Pacific. Get a sense of where it is. We can look at this map here at, at Google Maps. Uh, and we look down in the Pacific where there's really just ocean and ocean and ocean. Uh, we can find this tiny island called uh, Easter Island uh, that's part of Chile, uh, the country of Chile. It's a province of Chile uh, that's also known as Rapa Nui. In fact, Rapa Nui is the, is the name of the, of the island uh, that people who live there call, uh, that they call it, um, they, they call it Rapa Nui. Um, but it was known by Europeans as Easter Island, uh, partly because of the day it was found, which was actually Easter Sunday. Uh, but today we call it Rapa Nui. Now the island itself is only about 14 miles by uh, 10 miles across. It's a very tiny island um, uh, by any standard. And there really isn't any other island around it. So what makes it sort of remarkable is there's this teeny island in the middle of the Pacific uh, with nothing else around it. Um, so as I said, about 14 miles across, about seven miles in its width. It's a volcanic island. It's part of a, uh, a volcano that's undersea volcano ridge uh, that goes underneath the Pacific. And it's the one spot where this volcanic ridge emerges out of the ocean uh, so that it, people can live on that island. And you can see the entire island here. Uh, this is a, a radar image of the island to get a sense of the landscape. Again, you have to imagine yourself in the middle of the Pacific, thousands of miles away from anything else on an island that's only about 14 miles by seven miles. And that's it, surrounded by ocean. Now you wouldn't expect necessarily to find, um, uh, you know, on an island like this, the small size in its remote location, you might expect it to be sort of deserted. Who could possibly live on such a small space that's so isolated? Uh, but in fact, people did. Uh, people not only today do that, you can go and visit Rapa Nui and, and talk to Rapa Nui people uh, who still speak Rapa Nui language. Um, but we could, but their ancestors lived on the island and they arrived there about 1200 AD. So about 800 years ago, uh, Polynesians that were exploring across the, across the Pacific, going to places like New Zealand, um, Hawaii, Marquesas, the Austral Islands, Tahiti, uh, found uh, Rapa Nui as part of their colonization across the Pacific. And it's a really late part of an expansion of humans that initially started in um, Africa, spread across Asia, got to South, Southeast Asia, and then uh, spread into the um, Oceanic Islands. Finally, at 1200 AD, arrived on Easter Island. Now people lived on the island and people still, Rapa Nui people still live on the island, um, at a, starting about 1200. And they lived on there about 800 years prior to the arrival of Europeans. Europeans arrived uh, about 1722 AD, in fact, we know that, on Easter Sunday, uh, Dutch captain Jacob Rogoveen arrived on Easter Sunday and thus called the island Easter Island as a result of that. Though, as I said, we, we call it Rapa Nui today. Uh, Europeans then um, sort of arrived over a series of time. We've learned about that as Europeans uh, over this period of time since about 1722. Now what's remarkable on the island is that Europeans certainly surprised Europeans when they arrived on the island, was not only were there people living on this remote and tiny island uh, in the middle of the Pacific, the, but the people that were living there made really remarkable things, uh, gigantic statues that we call, and, and people called at the time, moai. Moai are these large, large statues made out of stone, carved by humans, and moved across the island. Now, what's remarkable about this is this, again, if you sort of think about the island as 14 miles by seven miles, uh, it's a very small place with not that much resources uh, and no other place to go get resources, yet people got together for, for somehow and were able to uh, carve these statues um, and, and put them across this island. Now, these statues are iconic. Uh, you know, we, we know them from various cartoons. People always talk about the heads of Easter Island, but these are all full statues uh, that were carved by prehistoric people beginning in about 1200 AD up through the point in which Europeans arrived, at least until that point. Um, these iconic statues were carved and, and you, many people have seen them. This sort of, this is a symbol of Polynesia uh, they show up, they're world famous, they show up in museums, you see them icon, iconographically in all kinds of places, um, these, these famous faces of Easter Island. And these are features that, that um, will be part of uh, this new exhibit at the Botanical Gardens, so replicas of these. 
the photos, I mean, these things are really amazing in sort of their profile, uh, the stone uh, giants looking out across the landscape. And a lot of, a lot of the focus uh, that we have, sort of awareness that we have of these things often comes from their um, faces and the faces looking across this landscape. Um, and here we see the statues, uh, and we'll see this is actually near the quarry where they're being constructed, st uh, standing up, looking out across the landscape. It's as though uh, overseeing this, this uh, tiny island and its inhabitants. Now the statues themselves are carved. Uh, they're carved out of stone. And that the, the source of that carving is, is a, a quarry called uh, Rano Raraku. Rano Raraku is a, uh, um, a volcanic crater that's in the southeast corner of the island. Um, and it's from the cliffs up on top here that statues were carved. Um, and let me just get a little laser pointer here. Uh, statues were carved up here and then brought down to the bottom of this cliff to be stood up to be finished. Now, a lot of the statues that you see, the, like the ones where we see the heads, are, um, are the are parts that are exposed of full statues that are actually standing with their bodies uh, underground. And the heads of Easter Island are really down here. But really, and every, this is the secret everyone should know, is that these are all full statues. Uh, and what we're just seeing is the topmost part of the statue where the rest of it's buried. In fact, you can see statues in the process of being constructed. If you look right here really closely, you can see a statue that's being carved, a massive statue that's being carved that wasn't completed uh, in preparation for being slid down the slope and to put up and being prepared here. But all the places that you see these linear um, uh, marks here across the surface are places where statues were being constructed. Now the statues uh, were carved in, in, in places like uh, Rano Raku. Most of them were actually carved, 95% were carved at Rano Raku, but they weren't meant just to stay there. In fact, people, uh, ancient people, ans uh, ancestors of Rapa Nui people today carved these statues in order to be transported. They took these statues uh, massive, gigantic statues, and then brought them across this volcanic island to be stood up at places called Ahu. Ahu are gigantic platforms constructed to put the statues on top of. Uh, and those statues were placed with their backs to the ocean facing the community uh, with the idea that these were ancestors uh, that, that were um, overseeing the community and its livelihood on this tiny island. <clears throat> these platforms are really impressive in and of themselves, these ahu. Uh, they're they're multi-ton stones that are supporting these gigantic, gigantic stone statues. And here is Tongariki with its 15 statues in a row. There are a variety of ahu across the island, in fact, hundreds of ahu uh, that have statues on them uh, in all different forms and shapes. Um, and you can see this is the backside of one of those ahu, uh, this is ahu um, anakena uh, or ahu nanao. Uh, and if you can see carefully here, you can see some of the back details of these statues that have carvings, uh, tattoos, and other kinds of designs on them. Uh, very elaborate structures and statues that are built for the community. Now to get a sense of the scale of these things, uh, you gotta put people next to them. It's hard when you look at the, at the platforms to sort of really understand the magnitude of these statues. Uh, in the 1980s, Thor Heyerdahl, a Norwegian explorer, excavated at Rana Raraku. Uh, one of the heads of East Island that you only see the head. And like archaeologists have known for a long time, these heads are really part of full statues and the statues are really immense. Um, they can be as large as three-story buildings. If you can imagine a three-story building made out of stone carved by people in the past um, and then moved across the landscape uh, to these ahu, uh, really gigantic things. And what's remarkable about these statues is not only was there one of these, uh, but we actually know of about a thousand of these statues across the island. About 400 or so were moved out of the quarry with 600 of them at the quarry in different phases of being constructed like the ones that we see here. Now, not only did people move these gigantic statues, and this is sort of the, the, the topper part, like you're, if you think, wow, people moved these gigantic statues, uh, but they also elaborated on those statues and put gigantic multi-ton hats on top of them. Uh, these things are known as pukau. Uh, which are made of a different stone from a different quarry, brought across the island, and then raised to be on top of the statues, these gigantic hats, pukau. Um, these things themselves are massive structures uh, that really boggle the mind is in terms of how people were able to transport these um, and put them on top of the statues that they moved 
uh, really extraordinary feats of engineering uh, and uh, abilities of, of uh, past people on the island. So here's what we know about the island, uh, the, the Moai here. There's about 400 of these statues um, uh, sitting at the quarry. You can go and visit the quarry and see many, many statues in different phases of being constructed. Uh, and about 62 of them are found along uh, in pathways on the way to Ahu, and then about 500 or so uh, um, statues on different um, platforms or Ahu. Uh, we've counted about 962 statues at this point as part of our work. Uh, just an amazing number of statues, each of which is gigantic um, and, you know, it's up to three-story building. And if you think about it, the size of some of those larger statues, three-story buildings, uh, they can be as heavy as 700 tons, or sorry, 70 tons, uh, which is the weight of a 747. You can imagine moving a giant rock like that. So one of the questions you have to ask, is sort of if you think about those statues and the people, uh, the island, its location, its remoteness, its sort of lack of a lot of resources, um, is how did people move them? How was that possible? Um, how could that have been achieved? And this is a question that scientists ask that we want to know the answer to this. Now, there are a lot of ways of coming up with those answers, uh, a lot of ways of trying to figure this out. We can make up stories, um, and, and come up with things that are plausible. And we can, but we can also do science where we can actually evaluate hypotheses and evaluate the ideas we have to see if in fact the world, the empirical record matches the ideas that we have. Is there evidence to support the ideas that we might raise? So that's, that's a big challenge for scientists uh, and a big challenge that, that we've been doing um, in, as part of our research on Easter Island. So, uh, a couple of things to know about archaeology is archaeologists are scientists. Uh, we study fantastic things, uh, things that are often somehow can be conceived of as inexplicable. But in fact, the point of archaeology is to explain the inexplicable, explain the mystery. And what we do is we explain the archaeological record, where the archaeological record is the, the material remains, the stuff that people leave uh, left in the past that we can study in the present to figure out what must have happened in the past. Uh, so we're scientists in that sense. We do science. Now scientists, all scientists, uh, generate hypotheses and draw conclusions uh, to see if th their ideas fit the evidence that they see. So whether you're a chemist or a physicist, a biologist, um, or an archaeologist, um, we, we generate ideas about the way we think the world works. And then we try to uh, evaluate the evidence that we see to see if how well our ideas match the world. Uh, and we try to figure ourselves wrong. What we try to do is figure out if this is true, what shouldn't we see? Uh, and if we see it, then we know we're wrong. So we try to challenge ourselves and try to figure out how something, our ideas can only be explained by the way the world works, not by something we're simply asserting. Uh, and can we be wrong about it? Now that's an interesting thing about science. Often people think about science as being, uh, being right and, and proving things to be true. But in fact, most scientists come up with ideas and then challenge themselves uh, to be wrong, to see if like, can we prove this to be incorrect? Things that are not shown to be incorrect turn out to be the ones that we, the hypotheses, the ideas that we, we, we rely on. Uh, this is the way all science works, whether you're a physicist, chemist, or geologist, or biologist, uh, you work in this very sort of finding out, you're challenging yourself to be wrong approach. What makes that, what, what's important about that idea is that it makes science an iterative process. We're always coming up with ideas, we're always trying to show them wrong. The ones that we show are wrong, we, we reject, and we come up with new ideas that can't be wrong or, or we can't show to be wrong. And then we go through it, that process again. So it's a constant process of trying to figure things out, what must be the case, uh, what shouldn't be the case, and then, and then fixing those ideas. It's, a, it's, a, it's an iterative process that makes science science. Uh, and what this means for archeology span is that often we can, if we sort of do this, uh, we can get to places and ideas about the past that we might not have imagined ahead of time. We, for example, in the, when we study the past, we take ourselves in the present uh, as sort of a given. We think, well, this is the way we would do something. If we had to move a gigantic statue, we would do it this way. Well, of course, the past is not the present. The things that we can do today, the resources we have, the technology we have, wasn't present in the past. Um, so people were doing things, you know, in different contexts for different reasons with different technology. Um, and so we have to reject ourselves. And, and that often leads us to sort of remarkable conclusions that may not be sort of uh, commonsensical when, as a place to start. And that's what we're going to see with these moving these statues. 
moving uh, Moai and sort of their transport is really a great example of how we can figure things out, even if the ideas initially seem preposterous. Now, when we look at statues, it's easy to think, well, man, those statues are huge. Those are gigantic rocks. Uh, and that this island is super tiny. And there weren't that many people on the island. Uh, and they didn't have steel. And they didn't have machines. They didn't have robots. Uh, they didn't have cranes. So clearly, it must have been aliens that came down and did it. Because we couldn't have done it without robots or cranes or um, steam engines or metal. Uh, so therefore, it must have been advanced aliens that flew in from outer space to make these statues. And that's really a sort of a cop-out answer in the sense that it says that, well, because we can't, we couldn't imagine doing it without those things, they couldn't have done it. And what we find as archaeologists is that um, the evidence of people having done it. Uh, so we know that Rapa Nui people, people uh, ancestral to the current Rapa Nui people uh, who lived on the island were able to do this themselves. It didn't require external people from space to do it. Although it's fun to think about aliens, uh, there really, there's no evidence that aliens had anything to do with this. Now, one of the things you might, might think about when you, when you imagine moving a gigantic statue is having some kind of contraption, some kind of wooden contraption, uh, whether that's a cart or a truck or something like that, uh, that would enable you to move the statues easily. Because certainly that's one of the ways as Europeans, uh, and, you know, pe people uh, sort of a modern day people today, you might think that would be a good way to do it. Let's build a contraption. And scientists um, and researchers uh, have long thought that some kind of contraption must have been implemented in the movement of these statues. And here we have Thor Heyerdahl on the right hand side of the screen here, uh, who in the 1950s uh, did an expedition to uh, well, late 40s, uh, expedition to Rapa Nui and sort of demonstrated like what could happen if you had a sledge made out of wood uh, to move the statues. Other researchers sort of followed up with that and shown that, well, if you have a bunch of wood um, and, you, and you have rollers or sliders, you can, you can move gigantic stones, uh, gigantic statues on the island. And that's certainly plausible uh, that that's wood could have been used for, the, for, for moving the statues. The question is really, is there evidence to suggest that wood contraptions were actually used for moving statues? It's plausible. You can do it. You can do it today. You can go in your backyard, chop some trees down, move gigantic rocks on rollers and, and some kind of contraption. The question really is, as archaeologists, is there archaeological evidence that demonstrates that wood is really the only, is, was actually used in the movement of these statues? Uh, and, and of course, you know, if you look at, um, uh, this is going to work. Uh, you know, a, a modern day replica of this, you can see that statues can be slid down um, on, on kind of rollers like this. But does this make this true? Now, one of the interesting things about the wood here that we want to recognize uh, is that the wood that is being used in this experiment uh, is eucalyptus wood, a uh, hardwood, the kind of trees that you typically find on the mainland um, that allow you to, to, to transport these statues. Um, on Rapa Nui, uh, on Easter Island, the island was dominated primarily by palm trees. Now, palm trees are very different kinds of wood uh, than, than hardwood that you find like eucalyptus. Eucalyptus were actually planted on the island only in the 1950s uh, and so weren't, wasn't there prior to the arrival of uh, what when Polynesians were there. It's only a really recent wood. Uh, palm wood, on the other hand, is a very soft kind of wood. In fact, it's, palm trees are grasses, um, have a kind of hard exterior and a mushy uh, interior. Uh, which makes them very flexible and, and very um, uh, uh, successful in windy environments, coastal environments, uh, but doesn't make them as good rollers or things to slide on. Now we can also ask, so we can think about plausible ways in which things, things happened. Uh, and there's lots of plausible possibilities using what, you know, different kinds of materials, but we can also think about, well, let's ask people, <laughs> what did the, what did Rapa Nui people say? Because Rapa Nui people today live on the island and you can go visit Rapa Nui people. Uh, if you go visit the island, there's a, there's a runway, you can fly there from Santiago, uh, you can talk to descendants of Rapa Nui people, and you can ask them, how did, how did, you, move the how did you move the statues? Well, in traditional um, uh, oral traditions, things that um, uh, you know, some elders would talk about, they, they would say things like, well, the statues walked and some fell by the way. Uh, this was noted by Catherine Rutledge, who was an early archaeologist in the 20th century, um, uh, who really uh, explored a lot of the island and, and um, was one of the sort of first systemat large scale systematic uh, analysts for the, for the island, uh, Catherine Rutledge. So the, so the idea that they walked and some fell by the way is really an interesting comment that 
uh, people uh, traditionally would say. And that led us, uh, my colleague Terry Hunt, who's currently at the University of Arizona, and myself, as well as colleagues from Rapa Nui, uh, here we have Nano, um, uh, led us to go and study the statues. Let's, let's look at the statues themselves, look at the archeological record to see if we can figure out um, aspects of the archeology span that will tell us um, something about the transport, how statues might have been moved. What can we learn that we can be wrong about? What ideas can we have that would falsify other ideas to lead us to the best explanation that we currently have? So we went and studied them. And that's, again, what an archeologist does. We go out to the world, we look at the archeological record, we make measurements, we take photographs and observations to try to study this problem and try to figure out what's going on. This led us to map the statues, uh, where the locations of them across the island. And we mapped statues that were at the Ahu, which are all the green uh, circles here. These are statues that made it all the way to the quarry or, or to, the, uh, to the platforms upon which they were stood. And we studied the statues at the quarry. These are the blue triangles here. The statues that were in the process of being carved, uh, we looked at those statues. And then we looked at the ones that were left along the way, as Catherine Rutledge said. And those are the ones that are these red starred statues. And we started to look at the fact that, well, there's actually three kinds of statues, or we should say three phases of statue construction that are really evident on the landscape when you look at all the statues. We have the ones that first are at the quarry uh, during their construction and shaping and in the process there. We have the ones that are on these pathways, and you can see these dotted lines, were actually called Moai Roads, and I'll, show, I'll talk about that in just a second. And then we have the statues that made it all the way to the, to the Ahu, to the platforms, where they were then put on these platforms to look at the community. So these three sort of phases of statues, we need to look at separately because they're telling us something about the sequence in which statues were moved uh, from, uh, from the quarry uh, to these Ahu. Now the roads as I mentioned uh, are really an interesting feature that's evident on the landscape. Now these are pathways that were constructed by uh, pre-contact by Ra ancient Rapa Nui people um, in order to uh, move the statues from the quarry. And here we're standing on the slope of the quarry at Rano Raku. You can see the ocean over here. Uh, this, this dotted line here is the path across which statues were, were moved um, on their way to these Ahu. And each of these little arrows that you see is actually one of those statues that fell along the way, uh, a, a road moai, a, a moai that was part of uh, the road transport uh, area uh, and not at the ahu and not at the quarry. Here's a road feature on the ground, sort of a close-up of that. Now these were constructed. So some people ask, well, how did they move it across that volcanic landscape? Well, people, actually changed the landscape to make it flatter. Now these, a lot of rocks have fallen in the middle here, uh, but effectively what they would do is smooth out this area, uh, these linear features and put curb stones along the edges of the road so that you could walk the statue straight down uh, the middle. And these prepared surfaces were the sort of causeway across which statues were moved. Now that to us sort of led us to an really interesting recognition that, ah, there's actually a path here uh, that across which the statues actually moved, that the people had to have overcome whatever they were doing or achieved a means of transport that took advantage of these roads. And these are the surfaces on which statues were transported. Now here's a, an aerial photograph of, of Mona, the Moai Road. Uh, you can see here this linear pathway uh, of this Moai Road. That was a pathway across which statues were moved. And there's some other structures here, a house, uh, and these are called Manavai, uh, gardens constructed in rock uh, that were used to grow crops that are alongside of one of these Moai roads. Uh, so we can look at this sequence. Uh, so we start to parse this out and look at the roads separate from the Ahu, separate from the quarry. So we can go back to the quarry and sort of reconstruct this transportation uh, steps. So Rano Rock, as I mentioned, is the quarry uh, uh, around which statues were moved. The statues at the bottom, which are the so-called heads of the statues, are actually full statues that are at the base of the quarry and that are buried uh, up to their up to their necks or their shoulders. The statue actually statues are actually carved up high on the cliff, uh, and and they're carved with their faces first, uh, and then their bodies are chipped out of the of the bedrock here. Uh, which is a, vol a compressed volcanic ash. 
that is the source of the material that the statues are made from. Uh, we can actually look archeologically and see the tools that are found around uh, these statues that were used by pre-contact pre people in order to chip out these statues. So this idea that, that space aliens or laser beams or something that was required, we can show to be not true. Uh, and we can actually see the tools and the marks that people used uh, uh, made with them uh, on the statues themselves. And these things are called toki. These are hand axes that are made of a slightly harder basalt material, volcanic material that's used for breaking the rock and chipping them off to create the shapes and the statues. Now, as I said, the statues themselves are carved high up on these cliffs here. Uh, these are the areas that they're carved. And then they're slid down this slope here into the base where they're stood up to be finished. Here's a sequence of what we think is going on here. And again, fits the evidence that we see of the statues and where they're being uh, made and, and moved is that the statues are carved high up on the cliff. They're chipped all the way around them. It's sort of an immense amount of effort to carve out all this material to finally get underneath the statue as it's laying on its back. Uh, that, that sort of creates a keel here where you're chipping in on both sides until it gets thinner and thinner and thinner until you're able to break the statue off. Uh, and once it's broken off, you can slide it down the slope and stand it up in a trench. The reason why you wanna stand it up is that you can finish the back side of the statue. The statue in the back has still the attachment to the bedrock and you need to chip that off in order to make it have the profile that you want it to have. Then you take the statue and you move it across these roads, uh, these Moai roads. And there's a network of roads. Uh, it seems that the roads themselves are constructed as part of the transport of the statue. Um, and that they go off in all directions around the island on the way to these different Ahu locations where the communities were living. Now, we, we started to look at these roads to see if like, well, what are the features that we find on uh, roads in um, uh, what are the what are the what are the moai look like that are on these roads? How do they? What shape do they have? How do they break? Uh, what, what's what's going on there? We found some interesting things that really uh, uh, um, led us to, to rethink how these things might have been moved. What we found is that the statues and here's a here's a statue uh, statue that was um, on its way away from the quarry. Uh, whenever we found it in a slope that was going up, the statue was on its back. And when we found the statue, uh, when the slope was going down away from the quarry, the statue was on its face. And that many times the head was broken and rolled off the front, suggesting that the statues uh, but prior to them on their face or on the back were standing up, standing upright in the same position that they were at the base of the quarry. But the quarry, we know where they're buried up to their neck are standing uh, what we find along the roads that they still appear to have been standing uh, and that fell over uh, one way or the other, depending upon the slope of the road. We also noticed that the statues themselves uh, on, the, on the roads didn't have exactly the same shapes as the ones that we find in the Ahu. The ones on the road um, are amazingly leaning forward, really far forward, such that if the statue was, was stood up again, because these statues are all fallen along the road, that they wouldn't even stand up on their own, that they would actually tip over, which is really surprising. Why would you make a statue that was gonna tip over? It really puzzled us for a long time. Why would you make a statue that would tip over? Because we know once you get to the Ahu, to the platform, the statues like the ones you can see behind me have to stand upright. So why would you make a statue that's gonna fall over and then change it so that it stands up? Why would they do that? And every single statue along the road was leaning forward like this, had this forward lean, uh, and very distinctive and distinctive of the, uh, the statues that made it to the Ahu. We know a couple of things happened between the statue, once the statues got uh, from, the, from the quarry to cross the road to the Ahu, to the platform themselves. One of the important things that happened is that the statues were, um, had eyes carved in them. Once they got to the platform and were stood upright, so they, and, and changed so they could stand upright, the statues um, went from having a notch where the eyes would be into a socket that was carved into the eyes, into the face, uh, so that you could put a coral inlay. An archaeologist, uh, Sergio Rapu, uh, in some excavations, uh, a Rapa Nui archaeologist, uh, has, has actually found fragments of the statue's eyes in the sands of Anakena, uh, these coral-shaped uh, features that perfectly fit within the sockets of the 
eyes that are carved into these statues. So people uh, systematically modified the statues once they got to these platforms. Uh, not only did they turn them on by putting the eyes in which the ancestors woke up and were able to look at the land, at the, the community, but they also changed the shape of them so that they could stand upright from going from a shape that was leaning forward to a shape that was upright that then could stand on the eye. So here's the overall uh, sequence of events for these statues. First, they're carved out of the top, slid down this uh, slope, stood upright. The back is, is chipped off, so it's, it's got the, the right profile. Some of the statues are abandoned. So one of the, some of the statues that we see are the heads are actually statues left where they were, that stood upright and never finished. That's either because they weren't able to finish them, uh, there was something wrong with them that they could move them, or they were, or they were in the process uh, and then never got back to it. The statues are then moved in a standing position, really remarkable standing position down the roads. When the roads were going downhill, they would sometimes fall on their face. When the roads were going uphill, they would fall on their back and they would be moving across these roads that were, trans that were formed uh, by uh, pre-contact people. When they got to their destinations, they were walked up a ramp uh, that, that was on top of the ahu and then turned around and modified so that they could face the community. Uh, one of the things that we know about the statues or we think we know about the statues is the fact that these represented ancestors and that they served as a, as a, as a, as a icon of ancestors that would then oversee and, and provide benefits to the community um, by looking at, at their activities. So uh, we did this by looking at these 62, you know, looking, trying to figure out uh, how the statues were moved. We looked at the road statues in particular, and we found many of them broken in, in different fragments, as I mentioned, broken uh, on the, ro the road moai were broken um, face down uh, or face up, depending upon the slope. Uh, and we found, again, sort of summarize this, the road moai, the ones that are found on the road are different than the ones that are made to the ahu. The ones that, are made, that, are, that get to the ahu are changed in order to serve that purpose on the ahu. This led us to a conclusion. Uh, the, the statues were, were walked in a vertical position. Sort of remarkable, really? They were walked? How is that possible? We'll talk about that in a second. We can actually ask Rapa Nui people about words that they used uh, in, in Rapa Nui language. Uh, and they actually describe a, a word called neke neke, which means walking without bending your legs, uh, sort of this shuffling walk. And they call that neke neke, which is the way we imagine that statues might be moving in this vertical fashion. We also think that based on our analysis archeologically, it's that this movement didn't require a lot of people, that it was done with relatively small groups who did it in a smart, smart way. And we'll see that in a second. We also don't think because they were moved standing that there were wooden sleds or logs or anything um, involved in that actual transport, that these were made because in fact, the shape of the statues themselves were made to be transported. Now that idea that these statues were made, uh, made to be moved in a standing position uh, sort of challenged us and, and challenged other people to say, well, let, if that's true, if that's archeological evidence points to these statues being standing and moving in this way, can we really see that? Can we really, could we falsify that? Could we show that that's not possible? There's just no way you could move a standing statue like that uh, that's gonna tip over in a standing position. So let's, let's try to challenge that and falsify it. So what we did and what we're, uh, was create a, a replica statue. We went to the road statues. We went to some examples of road statues and we created a digital model, very precise digital model of a road statue so that we could try and experiment. But we knew that the model was an exact replica of a, of a statue that was found along the roads. That data from that model was then uh, used to carve out a, 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 pla a sort of a plaster version of the statues that we used to create a mold. Uh, this was done up in uh, outside of Seattle uh, using a gigantic la uh, lathe that using a computer would lathe out at the shape of, of this moai to, this, to a millimeter precision. That was used then to create a fiberglass mold around that shape uh, in order to create a, 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 a thing that we could use to cast a cement version. Uh, that mold was filled with cement, uh, and that became our replica statue, exactly uh, um, uh, copying a, a road statue. The statue was then boxed up. <laughs> uh, this is for television. Uh, it was part of a Nova special that was done in 2012. 
um, uh, called the Mystery of Easter Island. Uh, the statue was boxed up and then brought to Hawaii, uh, the, um, uh, Oahu, um, the Kualoa Ranch, and uh, we did these experiments. We called the statue Hotu Iti, a uh, small Hotu. Uh, it's about 10 feet tall and weighed about five tons. 10 feet tall is actually a small version of the statue we replicated. We scaled it a little bit simply so we could put it in a box that we could ship in a, on a ship to get to Hawaii. Uh, it's a massively heavy statue. And if you try to shake the statue, it's immovable. We imagine several cars weight smooshed together in this 10 foet tall, five ton statue of Hotu Iti. We worked with um, uh, people from Hawaii as well as people from Rapa Nui um, on some of these experiments. Here we have uh, Sergio Rapu, the son of one of our, co our colleagues, Rapa Nui archeologist, um, who uh, and his family uh, who participated in these experiments. Uh, because really this is something, a tradition of theirs that we were investigating and we needed their collaboration and working with people uh, to sort of understand the, their perspectives on, these, on, this, on this challenge. Um, the, the, uh, uh, we brought together a lot of different group of people to try to understand this, this process uh, and to give it a shot, see if we could figure out how the statue could have been moved in a standing position. If you're interested to see the whole drama, I recommend you can go on, uh, I think on Amazon Prime and look at the Nova special, or it's maybe online at Nova uh, PBS uh, and see the, the, the documentary about this process. Uh, it was very stressful. Uh, it was a, an interesting experience to go through a television shoot for this kind of thing. Um, and uh, we, we uh, a lot of time constraints and stuff. And we chat, it was a challenge. It's always a challenge because moving a statue in a standing position um, may seem like, well, maybe they did it that way. Um, it, the actual reality of doing it was, was uh, tough. Now, one of the ideas we had about the idea of moving a statue in a standing position was the fact that it probably was not that different from the way you move a refrigerator from one side of your kitchen to the other. If you have a gigantic refrigerator in your corner of your kitchen and you want to move to the other side, you don't lay it on its back and put it on wheels and then wheel it across the kitchen and then pick it back up again. What you do is you kind of rock it. Uh, and, and by rocking it back and forth, uh, you can shuffle it across your kitchen with relatively uh, a few people, yourself or yourself and one other person might be able to move this uh, refrigerator. So we thought, well, there's probably something like that. But we had to figure out why would you make a statue that wouldn't stand upright? And you can see here the statue uh, that we've created here has this forward lean. In fact, if the crane, there's a crane holding it up, wasn't there, it would just fall on its own. So why would you do that? How would this have to do with it? So that led us to an experiment that finally we, we um, uh, got all the pieces together. And I'm gonna share this uh, video with you in just a second here. Uh, so you can see what we ultimately concluded. Let's go on. Stop, go back. Here, I meant to pause there for a second. So we ended up with three ropes, one in the uh, back that held the statue from falling forward, two on the side that allowed us to, to rock it back and forth so the statue would take steps. Now, as we did this, you notice that we started to say, uh, we were using the word heave ho. That was just sort of our sort of shorthand for saying how to coordinate things going back and forth. And as we, as we were doing this, we thought, wow, I bet culturally it would make sense that people would have a work song, that there would be a song that you would sing that would allow you to coordinate the movement of the statue and get the whole group working together to best facilitate the transport of the statue. We, um, uh, we thought about that and we talked to some Rapa Nui people They said, ah, oh, that sounds familiar with this movement of the statue reminds me of the song that my grandmother used to sing about the movement of the statue, the, the, the transport of statues. And, and we finally found somebody in the island to sing that to us. And I wanna share that with you uh, because it gets a sense of that this is part of a cultural tradition 
that we see there are still parts of that are part of Rapa Nui tradition uh, that are carried on. And that this work song uh, probably was one of many songs that were used uh, to transport, to, to, as part of the transport mechanism. Let me start here. So what we found was that the statues themselves, the ones that we saw on the Ahu, were carved in a manner that was consistent with being able to move them across that road. That the forward lean enabled you to actually rock the statues. And as you rock the statues, uh, the statues, because of the, uh, the shape and the rounded front edge, would actually enable the statue to take a step forward. That the construction, the shape, and the abilities of the statue um, all enable it to, to, to have this uh, transport ability, uh, that it's able to, to, to walk across the landscape with relatively and remarkably little effort. Once we got the statues walking, so moving back and forth, in fact, it wanted to continue walking, that we just had to add a little bit of extra force back and to keep it going back and forth, but it would continue moving forward in a very systematic fashion. And we were able to, in about half an hour, move it about 100 meters, um, which is pretty remarkable given the fact we were, if you could imagine people who are, this was their tradition and they grew up doing this, would be really good at, we were able to move it 100 uh, meters in, um, in about 30 minutes. Uh, it, it, that this is a great way to move statues uh, that, you know, us as beginners were able to do this. Certainly people who had a long tradition of moving statues this way would have made it, it would have been very simple to, to move it long distances. Um, what we're finding here, and this is the archaeological sort of conclusions here, is that statues were moved, made to be moved. But they were, the challenge to construct to people who carved them uh, was really to carve them in ways that enabled their transport. We can study the archaeological record and we can see the evidence of that uh, in, in the shape and the way that they fell and they broke down. And we can reach a conclusion that we currently can't falsify, that these were moved in a standing position using nothing more than small groups of people uh, with ropes. Uh, we know archaeologically that rope plants were available on the island. Uh, so this is a resource that they had plenty of and was consistent with the sort of scale and the technology and the resources that the island was uh, had there. So what do we know now? Uh, the Moai walked. Uh, the statues actually walked, just as people, Rapa Nui people had said in oral traditions uh, and ethnohistoric accounts. And they walked in this really spectacular way, carved in order to be transported across the island. It didn't take large numbers of people to do this, that small numbers of people, uh, relatively speaking, were able to move even the largest statues, uh, that this really was the way in which you had to move statues on this island. Uh, and that the technology that they had available, um, the, the technology they used to do it was something that was available on the island, 
uh, and consistent with the resources uh, that the population had access to. It didn't require uh, mowing down large forests uh, and making them into rollers and sledges and other things that people use the rock itself as the mechanism for transport, as well as human ingenuity. Um, and one part of our research and this is something we're working on uh, is understanding the context in which statues uh, made uh, sense for the island. Because if you imagine if you're making a thousand statues and you're moving them across the island, um, this you, you might make one for fun or because you're, you know, you, you're trying out something new, but doing it over and over again really reflects the, the, the centrality and the importance that statues had to communities and the success of the communities on this island. Now you have to remember this island is very remote, isolated, uh, that people had to work together uh, and share things in order to survive. And part of the hypothesis that we're working on as scientists here uh, going forward is understanding how statues served in this beneficial way uh, to benefit, to, to provide for the community and to bring people together to make survival possible and allow people to flourish on this island for as long as they have uh, up until today, that people are successful living on the island um, today. Thank you so much. Carl, thank you. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us today all about your research um, and your expertise on this topic. Um, we're gonna do a quick Q and A. We've got time for about three to four questions or so. Um, the first question that we're going to start with is, do the descendants of the statue builders who live today view the statues with the same cultural beliefs that their ancestors did? Great question. Um, we, there's a lot of continuity between uh, the ancient people, pre-European arrival people and modern people. People still speak Rapa Nui language. Uh, they still have Rapa Nui dance uh, traditions. Um, and, and there's a lot of things that are carried from the past uh, that we can, you know, that people have today, that people share today. We don't know exactly which parts. I mean, there's been a lot of disruption and we can talk about the history of the island um, and its changes. Uh, but the idea that these are ancestors is certainly a value that people have today and is consistent with po Polynesian traditions uh, across the Pacific. Thank you. Our next question is, why were the bodies of the statues buried and only the heads are visible? The statues at the quarry, um, all of them had to be stood upright in order to be finished because you can't finish the back of the statue unless it's sort of separate and standing up. Um, many of the statues then were finished and moved away. Some of the statues were abandoned. We actually don't know why they were, they were buried, whether they were buried um, as acts, you know, sort of abandoned and then left there and then erosion filled it in or if they were purposefully buried. That's something actually that needs to be investigated through more science and archeology. span Thank you. Our next question is from Pasquale who asks, do you know why the statues were built in the first place? That's a great question. There are many answers to that question. That's, it's, a, it's one of those that, why would you build a statue like that? One of them, you know, from the cultural perspective is that these represent ancestors and that you, you build them and to honor your ancestors and then you, you gain from them the benefit, the benefit of, the, of your ancestor looking over your community and your activities. So that's certainly one value that adds to them. The other one is, is simply that the act of building these statues and moving them as a group provides benefits to those groups that do that activity, that there's a community building dimension to these statues that, you know, that uh, directly helps the communities that, that make them. Thank you. For our next question, we have a attendee who is curious, uh, what additional items or topics are researchers hoping to understand by studying these statues further? Ah, great question. Um, you know, a lot of times people think of Easter Island and they see the statues and they think it's an example of people who did something crazy and did something that is inexplicable uh, and that puzzle, why would anyone bother to do that? What we've learned by studying these statues is the fact that they made sense within the context of the community and that the, the solution to living on an island that's isolated and remote and which have limited resources is to work together and that any mechanism that brings the community together has benefits towards dealing with shortfalls and uncertainty. Those lessons are really fantastic ones for, for the modern world because we're basically living on an Easter Island, facing shortfalls, and that scale of communities bringing people together is something that we really need to figure out how to best do. And our last question today comes from Mason who asks, do you think that their uh, engineering accomplishments influenced building processes later uh, in other places around the world, what they were able to do? Good question. Um, during the time in which people were living on Rapa Nui on Easter Island, um, they seem to be isolated, that we don't see contact 
of Rapa Nui people with other places in the, in the world, they're, they're relatively isolated. We do know that there's some connections with South America, but it's likely that people went to South America and brought the sweet potato back uh, into the Polynesia and ultimately led to people living in, uh, being able to live on Rapa Nui. Uh, the act of moving them was something that was uniquely um, Rapa, you know, the act of making these statues is something that was uniquely Rapa Nui. Uh, we actually see statue construction elsewhere in the Pacific, just not to the scale at which Rapa Nui people were able to do this. Um, so whether it inspires, I think in a more modern context, it inspires us. I think Europeans seeing this, realizing, wow, these people were able to do really remarkable things. Um, let's figure that out for ourselves. Um, so I think it's really been a modern inspiration more than anything. Well, thank you so much again for, for everything, your presentation, sharing your research and your expertise with us today. I know I've certainly learned a lot and it's I've been absolutely fascinating. Um, at this point, I'm gonna turn things over to Stephanie for some concluding remarks. Thanks, Brian. What remarkable information and a window into this world that you've shared with us today, Dr. Lippa, we really appreciate that. Uh, we'd like for you to take a moment to fill out a survey upon conclusion of today's program. Elise has placed that in the chat box. You can click the link there. Um, this will help us understand and be informed on what type of programs and, and where uh, the learning happens. So anything you can share with us is, is greatly appreciated. Uh, secondly, we want to make sure that you know how to learn more about Mounts and the Scientists in Every Florida School program by visiting the websites you see here and following us on social media. Uh, you can find a recording of today's program at our YouTube channel at UF Earth Systems. Um, we are looking forward to a continuation of the Into the Garden series this spring, including another live stream uh, event with Dr. Lippo to talk a little bit more about the Moai people in February. So be sure to join us. And once again,